Hello and welcome to York Observatory YouTube or Teletube, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. My name is Zaina and I will be one of your hosts this evening. I am joined by Professor Hyde and my colleague Dorsa, and of course our special guests this evening are Quentin Weirich, Bruce Waters, and Kathleen Houlihan Share. Broadcasting live from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Your QTU broadcasts every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time. And for any questions or comments you have of our previous shows, or if you have suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yourq.ca. You can always connect with us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and Facebook at Alan I. Carswell Observe. Good evening, everyone. I am Zaina and I am here with Dorsa and Professor Hyde. And we are here from the Alan I. Carswell Observatory at York University. Today, we are joined by special guests to talk us through their experience with observing the dark skies at Killarney Provincial Park. The observatory at York campus is in Toronto, and we would like to welcome all of you to our show and to acknowledge the traditional land that our telescope is on. The observatory acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takoranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Our stargazing and astronomical efforts join the long history and current practices of astronomy for this land. The observatory looks forward to continuing to learn and expand our knowledge in this area. I will now be giving it away to my colleague Dorsa, who will go through this week's night sky with you. Take it away, Dorsa. Thank you, Zaina. Welcome, everyone. Before we get started with our main show, we wanted to give you a little update on what you can see this coming week. This week, we have Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and many more celestial bodies visible. Tonight, you can see Saturn since its rising, its rising time was after 5.30 p.m. It has a magnitude of 0 0.59, which means you can observe Saturn with naked eyes at the southeastern part of the sky. It will appear as a, as a small bright golden star, actually, that does not twinkle and rather stays as a steady source of light. In the east, after sunrise, you can see Jupiter with your naked eyes, too. Jupiter has a magnitude of negative 2.91, making it a little bit brighter than Saturn and easier to observe. Our beautiful moon will rise around 8.12 p.m. and it will be in its Van Encabus phase. It will set around 10.34 a.m. actually. Mars is another planet that you may be able to observe after 10 p.m. tonight and it will rise from the northern east part of the sky. Alongside these beautiful planets and our moon, we have a few asteroids like asteroid 4 Vesta and asteroid 3 Juno with a magnitude of 7.14 and 8.43 respectively up in the sky after 5 p.m. But you will most likely need a small telescope or a pair of binoculars to observe these two bodies. Later in this week, you can see our moon still at Vening Gebis, slowly decreasing its illumination day by day until it reaches to 50% of its brightness. You can still see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars with the perfect visibility, of course, weather permitting, and Neptune or Uranus rising at 5.32 p.m. from southeast and 7.39 p.m. from northeast, respectively. They're visible too, but you can probably see them better with the telescope. The brightnesses are not in the same level as Jupiter or Saturn, especially for Neptune. These two planets are usually difficult to see without any form of aid. That's all from my part, everyone. Hope you enjoy observing these beautiful astronomical objects from the night sky this week. Professor Hyde, take it away. Thank you for the uh, wonderful recap. It's great to be here. Um, uh, I'm Professor Hyde, and I'm just going to say, uh, in addition to 
lots of asteroids that you might have a small chance of seeing, you won't actually see the DART target, <laughs> uh, which did get in the news today because it's been confirmed as having been deflected by that recent impact. So very exciting stuff going on all over. Unfortunately, in Toronto tonight, we do have clouds, so we're not going to be doing live imaging here at the observatory. To make up for that, I have three amazing guests that I'm going to be introducing. Um, and I'm going to just start off in no particular order. <laughs> so first and foremost, let me introduce, if you haven't met him before, Quentin Weyrich. He was the previous um, outreach coordinator for the observatory, actually, and is currently the outreach coordinator for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada at the David Dunlap Observatory. Most famously, he is also the very last astronomer in residence of 2022 at Killarney Provincial Park. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in physics from York University, and he's here tonight to uh, tell us not just about astronomers in residences and Killarney Provincial Park, but the whole Stars Over Killarney event, which just wrapped up. So, Quentin, uh, please go ahead and uh, say hello to everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Hyde. It's so great to be on the show tonight. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Amazing. Great to have you here, Quentin. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you throughout tonight. <laughs> um, so next up, uh, we have Bruce Waters, who is also joining us tonight. He is our Killarney Observatory expert, um, the one who basically came up with the exciting plan for the astronomer in residence uh, system that we are now uh, doing dually between, of course, the Alan Herschel Observatory and the Killarney Observatory. Bruce has been teaching astronomy to the public for a very, very long time and is absolutely a wonderful telescope expert and also the co-founder of Stars Over Killarney. So one of the perfect people to have join us tonight. So Bruce, um, why don't you come on and go ahead and say hi. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight and look forward to talking with you all this evening. Wonderful. Well, last and certainly not least, the one person who we could never have done any of this without. Um, Kathleen is here tonight, um, and she is the head park naturalist for Killarney Provincial Park, the person who makes it all happen with the Stars Over Killarney and the Astronomer in Residence program. She's given hundreds of public programs and connecting park visitors with the natural world. We, of course, know her very well for a lot of her astronomy uh, interactions, but she's done done amazing things across all kinds of different park programs. So if you've ever been out to Killarney Provincial Park, you've probably seen her and you've definitely seen her programs. Um, she is very interested in dark skies and the natural ecosystems involving them. So Kathleen, uh, please come on and say hi to everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that very sweet introduction, Dr. Hyde. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, what, we're really, really happy to have you all here with us tonight. We are going to be bouncing around a little bit through the stars over Killarney. And to get this program started, what I'm going to do is tell you not just a little bit about uh, stars over Killarney, but Killarney Provincial Park is a few hours drive, um, you know, between four and six, depending on if it's me or Bruce driving. Um, <laughs> and we have amazing dark skies out of that location. We've been fortunate enough to run our first ever astronomer in residence program this summer 2022 uh, and Quentin is the last astronomer for this year but hopefully not the very last. We hope to do it again next year and the last big event while we had astronomers in residence was Stars Over Killarney. Stars Over Killarney ran very recently. We had a September 30th, October 1st in October October 2nd. And this program is a really, really fun astronomy science extravaganza out at the Provincial Park. So it started off on the Friday evening, and I believe the theme was uh, 4.5 billion years in the making. Now, uh, Kathleen, was that a title that you came up with? No, I actually, I believe that Bruce gets the credit for that title. Bruce? It roughly works to my age, four and a half billion years. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, no, it's it's uh, a title that came from the sheer fact that we we're trying to connect the astronomy and the cosmos above to the incredible geology that Killarney really helps to emphasize within the Ontario Park system. 
So the Amazing. title will work for that. Well, and we will definitely see some slides to that effect uh, throughout throughout this evening. And it seems like your first program was the experience, the sort of the wonders of the uh, the stars and the moon from Killarney on that Friday evening. Uh, we do have, of course, a few um, advantages of that location, not just being the wonderful dark skies, but the observatory that was out at the dark skies as uh, as shown here. And I believe this is one of your pictures as well, um, as well, Bruce. We have um, a huge group sort of enjoying the, the beauty of the Killarney Provincial Park Dark Sky Preserve, which it, it is a dark sky preserve, and these uh, observatories. Now, which observatory is this? Can you identify it in the, uh, in the dark here? A uh, question for myself, that's the Kiche Wasa the Bobbing Observatory, which means seen greatly far at a distance. And I'm sure we heard, if you, just in case every, anyone missed it, there are in fact two observatories out at the park, uh, two telescopes, I should say, in the observatory out at the park, which we talked about with Quentin before last week. So they're both wonderful little telescopes and um, they do let you, indeed, they do let you see very, very, very far. <laughs> uh, Quentin, do you have a, a favorite telescope of the two? Oh, <laughs> I would have to go with, um, personally, I mean, they're, they're, they're excellent. There's, there's of course, the 16-inch uh, the telescope, which is, I believe, the one in this image right now, because uh, that's the one we were using at night to view planets. Uh, and, of course, we have the 10-inch telescope, uh, which we use for solar viewings. And we also have uh, some smaller ones that are inside the observatory domes as well. I think... Uh, that my favorite uh, activity was uh, doing the solar observing. Uh, it was so much fun, uh, just aligning to the sun and uh, sh showing the like uh, image of the of the sunlight on your hand. So I, for that reason, I think I'm a little bit partial toward the ten inch. Uh, but they're they're both absolutely fantastic telescopes. They, we got some great images with them. Uh, so it was so much fun working. with Amazing. So we will get to see some pictures of that later. Um, we do have some solar observing that happened, I think, on the next day. On the first day, it was uh, mostly um, just regular viewing at the observatory. And I do have to say the stars over Killarney also had some smaller telescopes from the Sudbury and North Bay Astronomy Clubs, which is really cool. And they're not pictured here, but I can just imagine them clustered around the grass. <laughs> um, I, presumably they were in the same area. Um, all right. So as we're going forward on our first uh, our first day, uh, we did you did also have a really special event. And this was a special introduction, um, which was by Ojibwe knowledge carrier and professor of Indigenous studies Will Morin. And Bruce, this was uh, an introduction you, you set up. Um, shall we go ahead and, and play the introduction or do you want to say a couple words about it here? Uh, no, just very briefly, it was the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation and both Kathleen representing Ontario Parks and myself and our guest, Professor Morin, all felt that we needed to do a proper, not just a land acknowledgement, but an acknowledgement of the day. And so uh, what you're seeing is a portion, it's a clip from the entire song, uh, the welcoming song, um, but I'll leave the rest of it to the beautiful video that you're about to see. Excellent. So I'm actually going to insert the regular video on top just to make sure that we get a good playthrough of this. And a huge thanks uh, to Professor Morin um, for doing this on the night and listen to this uh, short clip. Garbage, I in garbage, I in, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, garbage, 
amazing clip um huge thanks again of course uh and all credit to professor morin ojibwe knowledge carrier and professor of indigenous studies um what an amazing amazing moment i unfortunately wasn't there for 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 it but from the people who were there um how how was it well it was truly uplifting um you know i'll just jump in for a second and i don't know if anyone noticed as we played the video but in the background just to the right uh, of uh, professor morn you can see on our live feed of saturn at the same time so you know one of the reasons we do these programs is to connect the external universe with us as individuals and hearing professor morn sing in anishinaabe Mon's beautiful song welcoming all of us there and seeing the live image of Saturn at the same time was, was truly outstanding. Kathleen, Quentin? No, I would just completely echo what you're saying, Bruce, and, and what an appropriate um, and really powerful way to kind of kick off uh, Stars Over Killarney and make sure that we took that time just to um, consider the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation as well. It, it was such an honor to be there and, and to just be a part of that experience with, with everybody else. Um, I can really I can really tell that everybody was um, was 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 eager to to participate and, and to and to be present for it. It was it was a, it was a lovely experience. Amazing. Well, I am super, super jealous. So you heard it all here first, folks. If you missed your chance this year, make sure to catch the stars of our Killarney next year. Um, it is uh, it's already day one is all we've gotten through and it's already been amazing looking. <laughs> Um, so, okay, I think we should probably go on and tell a little bit more about the rest of the adventures that happened, uh, because this was actually just the very, very start of the first day. This was just day Friday. Um, and then we had the actual real big Stars Over Killarney Day, which was Saturday, October 1st. And this was a really fun day because it was actually Nuit Blanche in Toronto at the same time it was... Um, busy time at Stars Over Killarney Day. So we had a joint stream with Quentin. I don't know if anyone caught that. We'll play a little bit of it later on in this show. Uh, but they were literally doing everything. And we had hundreds of people at the telescopes here, hundreds of the people at the telescopes there, two different astronomy events running at the same time with the same live stream. And uh, it was just an amazing, chaotic um, bundle of astronomy awesomeness, as far as I could tell. Now, out at Killarney, we also had a whole bunch of hikes and geology happening, which is not something that... Um, we tend to get to do very much of at York University. So I, I recall that the, one of the first things uh, that Bruce told me you all did was having a group assemble near a trailhead to participate in a three hour hike with world renowned geologist, Dr. Gordon Oz uh, Ozinski, who talked about some of the spectacular geology um, and the ancient forces that created it. Um, so Kathleen, this is actually you getting ready to lead uh, one of these hikes, I believe, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the hike you led on that day and uh, some of the activity? Yeah, I would be delighted to. So uh, this hike was such a fun way to start the day and, and kick off the busiest day of the festival. Um, and something I found so interesting was tying kind of two of the things that Killarney Provincial Park is really known for together. So the astronomy program, the protection of dark skies with the absolutely incredible um, 
geology of the area and we were so lucky to get to host um, Oz there for this event because he did such a terrific job for all of our, our hike participants in really joining together telling the story, the, the billions of year long story of the geology of Killarney and helping us to understand that history in the context of astronomical events, but also just the history of the park and, and how long the park uh, has been forming in order to be the incredible place that we enjoy today. Um, and it was also just really cool. I mean, it's one thing to do a presentation at the amphitheater and to talk about the geology. It's another thing entirely to actually be out on a trail, looking at these land formations, um, having somebody with as much knowledge as Oz has actually describe what we were seeing uh, as a group, being able to answer people's questions, being able to pull everything together for us. So just a, a really fabulous way to start the festival off. Wonderful. And I, I do believe you covered all kinds of really interesting rock formations that a lot of us astronomers care a lot about in, of course, the wide field of planetary sciences. Things like granite, magma, quartzite, mountain building, um, uh, all kinds of different things that happen here on Earth that we can use as an analogies to other planets or even exoplanets. Um, and of course, uh, out at Killarney, you also had a lot of features from glaciation, which I believe Killarney is pretty famous for. Um, so this is a picture from uh, Bruce, actually, I believe you, you, were you on this hike? I was, but hiding myself and just taking pictures in the background. That's a perfectly good thing to do. <laughs> um, so this is a picture of your uh, hike group, I guess, and some of the features they were going for. Uh, these gentle grooves up at the top, those were the glacial waterfalls, I believe they're called. And for a fully detailed explanation, I will hope to, that at some point we can get Dr. Oz to come on and uh, tell us <laughs> tell us about it in another teletube sometime. Um, but uh, is it true that they had the um, uh, the rock rushing upwards through the glacier? Is that how they described it to you? I will answer if Kathleen doesn't uh, want to. Um, yeah, I think we're all astounded. I've been going to Killarney for 41 years and seeing these features and never really understanding how these beautiful grooves were carved other than just assuming glaciers had traversed over them. But what Oz explained to us, and I think most of us were kind of interestingly shocked by it, was that the water you see, or the grooves you see there, I should say, is actually water rushing upwards from the lower left to the upper right. So if you want to just put your mouse here, so in that area there, up and towards the right, water was actually rushing up. And we're all kind of saying, well, we've seen rivers, we've seen streams, how does water rush upwards? And what he described is based on his experiences of when he takes his students out into the Arctic, and onto glaciers is that the water will crack through the glaciers into waterfalls that could be literally a thousand meters high. The force of that hits the ground and splashes out. In this case, from the way he understands it, and he didn't go into that level of detail, he could tell that the water actually was rushing upwards and carving that out over periods of not uh, five years or 10 years, but it could have been hundreds or thousands of years. We don't know how long that would have been, but it's an incredible idea to basically have almost like a pressure hose scouring out that rock in that beautiful smooth manner you see in the picture. Amazing yes so something to watch out for I suppose next time you're on a hike at a park especially Killarney Provincial Park. Um, Kathleen you you went up up the uh, up the hike as well? I did yeah no and it's it's a treat because I mean, I do programming about the geology, but um, my background definitely isn't as advanced as Oz is. And so what Bruce sh just shared, right, that was something that I had a misunderstanding about how that rock formation was created. Um, and it's fabulous to have that new knowledge to make sure that we're describing those formations correctly when we're doing outreach to the public. Amazing. Yeah, I certainly would not have guessed water rushing upwards would cause the, uh, the, the, the flow uh, grooves, shall we say. Um, but this is one of the great things about, about geology is you can get these really interesting features formed in really interesting ways. Um, and it just makes you wonder, well, what if we did have a colder, uh, icier, 
larger planet, what would happen then? And so you get your astronomy overlap very easily here. <laughs> uh, um, really fun times. Um, and Quentin, were you on this hike? Wouldn't have missed it for the world. Yeah, I was on this hike. It was, uh, it was an excellent hike. And I, when I was on this hike, what I was really thinking about was, I guess, kind of another way that to me, uh, geology and astronomy are connected is that they remind us that everything around us, even the ground beneath our feet, even the stars above our heads are constantly changing and that they are, um, that they evolve in time, they aren't static. And we are all a part of that process. And uh, it's, it's, it's just really fascinating and beautiful. And uh, it's so nice to be able to see and have it pointed out to you that there are physical, there is physical evidence of that process of the continual change of uh, the earth. Uh, and it, it was just such a gift to have the opportunity to actually uh, experience that firsthand. So uh, yeah, I, I, when I found out about this hike, I was like, I need to go on and it didn't disappoint. Amazing. So three hours of geology and awesomeness. I am just getting more and more jealous the farther we go. And it's about to get even worse because the next up on the list is, of course, the drop-in sessions, which we're running on the same day, mind you. So after a three hour long hike, um, you then got to go in and help out with some of these drop-in sessions. And this is, in fact, uh, the same person you're seeing in the video, Quentin, in, in this picture. Um, and I believe this is the Wasa de Babing, uh, seeing at far distance observatory that uh, with Bruce or you mentioned before. And you've got your solar filter installed, so it's uh, safety first. <laughs> and we have, of course, uh, I'll just advertise this a little bit, our astronomer in residence, Quentin Lee Rich, running this telescope. So um, we had a lot of fun uh, thinking of, you know, different types of solar programs that, that might work with this. And uh, I'll let, just let you go ahead and describe your, um, your solar viewing adventure, Quentin. Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, everybody uh, would come in and they're like, wow, you can actually look at the sun with that? Is that safe? There are a few people who were a little bit, um, who were a little bit worried about it because like, you know, our, our, all our lives were told, oh, you can't look at the sun. And you can't look at the sun unless you have a filter like this one, which is filtering out so much of the light that it is now safe with you um, with your naked eye. Um, and it, it, it was just, it's, it's a very different paradigm, to, even to aligning the telescope, because you can't look through the finder scope directly, that's dangerous. So what you have to do is you have to take the lens cap off of the finder scope, point the sun in the general direction of the, of, uh, point the telescope in the general direction of the sun, and then find the light from the sun on your hand as you're aligning it and, and center it within the shadow. Um, it's, it's, so, it, it's so interesting, it's so different. Uh, even the idea of operating a telescope during the day, it, it's just, I loved it. I fell in love with this process. Yeah, it, it is very, very fun. And of course, you can use the um, the shadow of the telescope a little bit as well uh, to do some shadow minimization. Uh, and not to mention letting people get their own images. And I have it on good authority that both of these were actually captured by a cell phone camera. <laughs> Um, and the yeah. one on the, the left is yours, Quentin. Yes. And in fact, um, you can't see it in the images, but this was during Stars of Recording as well. So we did have a few other astronomers who had set up their own telescopes, with their own filters. Uh, one, one person had a hydrogen alpha filter on their telescope instead. Oh, so those are the, so nice. Yeah. So it was, it was this bright beautiful red image of the sun and you could see the features like the filaments on near the edges of the sun that you couldn't see through the white light filter um and somebody else had set up a i believe they had a coronagraph set up that allowed them to view venus we were viewing venus during the day um thanks to the other uh observers at this event so it, it really was incredible to get to do this during Stars of Okalarni because there was always somebody else there who uh, any anything you anything you you could ask for any like 
target that you'd have in mind. Somebody else is always like, oh yeah, I'm already aligned to it. Come here. And it was, it was just great. It, it, this great sharing of knowledge. Lots of telescopes. The more telescopes, the better, I suppose, is a, is a good motto for, uh, for well for this show. And Kathleen, uh, you've been running these solar observing programs all summer now with various different astronomers and residents. Uh, how have you found the solar programs? Yeah, I echo a lot of what Quinton just shared, just that they're a huge hit with our campers. Um, it's something that can be done during the day, which also I think makes it accessible um, to lots of folks who have their families, especially their kids with them, where it might be, you know, interfering with bedtime a little bit to have them out in the evening. Um, it also just, there's, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but there's something about actually having people in the dome looking through the eyepiece that I think is a really special part of doing astronomy and a really special part of doing solar programming um, because we are welcoming people to look through uh, the Wasu de Bobbing telescope to be able to see the sun and just having that real like firsthand experience, I think, is important and inspiring for our visitors. Um, and I mean, like you, like you pointed out, these are our pictures that were taken on people's cell phones. And I think allowing people to do that as well. So they're capturing their own memory of their experience. They're able to share that. Um, you know, with family and friends and stuff. Um, that's exactly the type of programming that we're looking to facilitate uh, at the park. Amazing. And I just have to go on to the next program, which is also another amazing, we, we should do more of this because this was the Nature Center program that you had running. And this was, I believe, just for Stars Over Killarney. At least I didn't see it on any of the programs when I was there. Um, so this is the Nature Center. And we had uh, Discovery Staff Interpreter Kate Ward, who put on an embroidery program, Stitch the Stars. And this is a absolutely amazing scarf with Cygnus, Draco, and other constellations. And so this, it, this just absolutely blew my mind when I saw it. Um, it looked so much fun, like just amazing. Kathleen, were you, were you in there? So I uh, am very lucky in that I've actually <gasps> done <What>? my own. <laughs> Um, in preparation for leading this program, uh, Kate did do a session just with us staff as um, even just through kind of her procedures for how she was going to uh, teach people who had maybe not done embroidery before, such as myself, um, just the process of, of how to um, yeah, guide them through this process. So she had made templates up and everything. Uh, maybe a little bit of a preview, I guess, or a sneak peek for next year. Another kind of goal um, for Killarney, again, is to be able to combine kind of artistic endeavors with the programming that we're doing as well. Um, and again, just like I mentioned, having stuff that we do that is hands-on, that allows people to bring a little bit of the park home with them, um, perhaps through something like embroidering a constellation. Um, I mean, so fun, so fun, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, and then I think the other thing is, the, you know, I did Ursa Major as my constellation, I'm not likely to forget the shape of that constellation, right? So incorporating art um, into our programming is just another way that we're able to touch on different learning styles and have an educational experience that is, is meaningful and fun and actually, you know, I mean, teaches people something um, about astronomy. Absolutely. And uh, what they like say is, you know, writing something down is proven to help you remember it. Embroidering something. Now that you're, you're not going to forget that. <laughs> so uh, that just looks absolutely amazing. So I think it's um, a wonderful. I hope to see a lot, lot more of it. Um, now at the same time or just shortly after. So this was running at the Nature Center. You also had dry ice and craters running. So this was uh, at the amphitheater, either at the same time or just after, I think, on the schedule. And this was a comet making workshop with uh, Vicky and Bill Sherwood on the right and um, showing, you know, basically how comets are made. I think it's quite similar to the one that we used to run at the observatory when we had more supplies laying around basically dry ice, charcoal, some sort of organic organic compounds. And that shows you how comets are actually put together. And of course the dry ice evaporating makes a 
pretty nice comet tail usually. And then after that ran, we had, uh, you, you had a crater making demonstration from Dr. Sarah Mazrui, who's, um, you know, you might remember from previous years, uh, York Universe radio show, she used to be on with us, I think, I'm not sure if she's still listed, <laughs> but uh, we haven't seen her there for a little bit yet. Um, she is uh, amazing with crater workshops and an amazing science communicator. And there's flower at the base. And I'm not sure what she used on top, probably some sort of maybe cocoa powder or yes, <laughs> Kathleen saying yes. <laughs> um, really, really fun. Um, so these were these your two main amphitheater activities, Kathleen? Yeah, so actually all four of the workshops, I guess, except for Kate Stitch the Stars one, so I should say the three workshops um, were kind of run more drop-in style so that people could come for as long as it suited them and their needs. Um, and so these were, both of these were happening one after the other, but again, um, you know, folks could come for as long as it suited them. Um, and both of them did happen at the, the amphitheater. And again, that just allows for, for folks to get nice and up close to see these demonstrations. The cratering workshop, especially, um, we had some live hands on demonstrations where um, some kiddos actually who were in attendance had so much fun getting to find different sizes of, of rocks and pebbles in order to actually make this, uh, this cratering effect happen. And how fun to actually see them start to think about, oh, like the bigger the rock that I get, the, the bigger the crater. <laughs> The, the more mess that I can create. But um, also, I mean, uh, Dr. Mizrui did an excellent job kind of instructing the, um, the, the children to throw from different angles to see what would happen um, and just kind of, yeah, really incorporating that hands-on science. Yeah, and, and when you go to look at the moon next time and you wonder how it got all these strange, weird craters on it, um, you, you start to have an idea, ah, maybe some of them are from different angles or different sizes or overlapping. Um, so this is great. And the, the reason for the different colors in this case, especially so that you can really see the ejecta. So you hit it with something and it's the material underneath that's actually thrown up out of the, uh, well, out of the tray in this case and sort of flies in every direction. And if that material flies high enough, if it's on something like the moon or Mars, that little bit of moon or Mars could actually fly through space and detach. It could be going the escape velocity. And we actually think that we've been hit by a piece of Mars that did exactly that. Um, so understanding these dynamics is super, super fun. And I'm just absolutely pleased that you you were able to, uh, to do these uh, live demos in person so people could play along. That's just so cool. And interestingly, actually, the, the park has a lunar meteorite and a Martian meteorite, precisely as you just described which were pieces of those particular bodies that were impacted by asteroids or whatever, and fragments of them left those pla the planet Mars and the moon and arrived at the Earth. I don't think we should toss them into the flower pit, though. No, please do not. <laughs> so, Kathleen, I think uh, you should make that not allowed. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, a great segue into, and that'll get you back to geology as well, because then you're looking at rock types and it just all ties together. Super, super fun. So this is the video of the, uh, of the impact that was done on the day. Um, hopefully everyone got to see that pretty fun. It's um, feel free to make this experiment yourself. If you have a uh, flower and something, um, uh, dark colored to go on top of it and any kind of rocks that you want but make sure to do them outside because <laughs> it will splash uh, excellent all right so we had this going at the amphitheater and you also had amphitheater at night uh, which is our traditional I suppose Killarney astronomer in residence nighttime amphitheater talk uh, which is sort of a twilight talk now in this case you had back Dr. Oz, Dr. Osinski, um, to give an evening talk at the amphitheater. And I believe this is um, the slide or the, the talk slide showing there in the back. 
without too much, um, you know, spoilers, I suppose, uh, cratering and craters on the moon tie right back into this talk, don't they? Um, was anyone there for this talk, Bruce? I think we were all there for the talk. Uh, as you said, this was a twilight, also a keynote talk for the event. Um, just to get some context, in case uh, your viewers are not aware, uh, Dr. Osinski is actually hired and uh, works with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency to bring their astronauts up into Sudbury, which is the result of an uh, impact crater from roughly 1.8 billion years ago, and high up into the Arctic into Devon Island to understand what cratering uh, looks like and the results of it, and how to identify rocks, and therefore basically learn field geology, much in the way that the Apollo astronauts learned field geology on Earth before they went to the moon back in the late 60s, early 70s. In fact, some of the Apollo crews, Apollo 15, I think, and 16, also went to Sudbury to learn geology there. So Dr. Sinski actually takes the next group of astronauts up to Sudbury and then High Arctic and Dead Devon Island and teaches them how to recognize field uh, materials that they would see there, because there's a, so much of an analogy between what we would see on the earth and what we'd see on Mars and, or the moon. And so by seeing basalt on the earth, we can recognize basalt on, on Mars. And you know all these other features, we talk about glaciation, we won't see much glaciation on the moon, but when time, when we go to Mars, you'll see glaciation there. And it's that kind of information that they, those scientists of the future, those astronauts of the future can bring back and be more educated to help us understand how these planets and how the moon formed. So his talk really was all about his experiences and you know how he's involved in us reclaiming and going back to space. And of course, we're going to have to do a whole extra teletube on uh, back to space and the moon. So we'll probably leave that for, for now and um, just mention the, uh, uh, the talk apparently ended up with a very, very famous astronaut um, uh, um, quote, uh, which was um, the Earthrise image on the left captured by Bill Anders inspired an astronaut, Jim Lovell, to state that uh, seeing the earth from here is the grand oasis in the big vastness of space. And it really is, it is it is an amazing oasis compared to, well, the moon for one. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, the importance of protecting earth um, for, you know, ourselves and future generations um, is something that a lot of people who have gone into space have have remarked on. And of course, after this presentation, everyone got to go back to the observatory, which is one of the great places to look at things in the sky. Um, so this was back to the Double Dome Observatory with the telescopes um, from, I, I believe the volunteer telescopes were also set up as well. And these are some actual images captured on the night. And so we're going to actually start off with a little bit of live imaging from the night. Now we have a video set to um, a bit of music. So this is from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and this is um, for the Stars Over Killarney, uh, Stars Over Killarney event. So we're actually gonna just go ahead and start off with a, a nice little bit of music here, if I can get it going. Uh, with this live imaging of the king of the planets, Jupiter. Amazing. And that, um, so that was playing as the stream was running. And this, of course, was also going live on our YouTube channel while we were running uh, Nuit Blanche. And it was also playing at the 
um, observatory inside the projector on the one meter dome. And we didn't have the amazing, uh, amazing music, but we did have, um, we did have some of the imaging, which I've got here. So if you want uh, imaging with no music, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is freely available. There's about two and a half hours of it. I'm actually just going to push play here. And Bruce, um, the music that you had, that um, Toronto Symphony Orchestra, that was a recording that you got from them, correct? That is correct. So um, both uh, Kathleen and I are big believers in combining all aspects to appreciate astronomy and appreciate the context of Killarney. And so artwork and, and art in general is part of that. And what better way to celebrate seeing the beautiful planets and understanding our solar system than by combining it with the music of the planets from Gustav Holst. So we'd reached out to the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and they were gracious and generous enough to allow us to play the clips live for the purpose of the program. Uh, and that's what we got to enjoy while we were seeing the planets. I should comment that you're seeing the planet Saturn jumping around. Uh, unfortunately, it was very, very, very windy that night. So it was a very turbulent night. The stars were twinkling like crazy but that also had the impact of making the planets a little fuzzier and less sharp uh, than we would have liked. But nevertheless, you get an appreciation for seeing, in this case, Saturn and previous to Jupiter. Absolutely. And as the music was playing, so just to give everyone a little flavor of the evening, the music was playing, the images were showing um, on the projector screen as well as you know, in the telescope. And Quentin, you were out telling everybody all about it, weren't you? I sure was. Uh, on both nights, I was going around uh, giving people fun facts about the planets, uh, answering any questions that people had about astronomy. I was, uh, what I did was I had a little mic attached to me and I would go throughout the crowd and uh, if anybody had a question for me, I would answer into the microphone so that everybody could hear the answer to the question. Uh, and it was just, it was just a great night getting to interact with so many uh, interested members of the public. Absolutely. And um, Kathleen, were you running the telescope or were you uh, <laughs> in the back? No, I had such a treat that night in that my staff member, actually the, the one who ran the um, Stitch the Stars program, Kate Ward, she was on the telescope that night uh, and I got to actually just enjoy uh, and I mean, listen to Quentin give some fabulous information about the different planets, take a peek in the dome, and then of course, uh, also mingle with the Sudbury and the North Bay Astronomy Clubs um, because they had their telescopes set up as well and, and were showing other things. And so just an excellent opportunity to take in all of those wonderful features of this event. Absolutely. And so as you were going through, we, we've shown the uh, Jupiter with uh, with the music, um, Saturn uh, at the beginning, and I believe this is now Neptune, although I'll take any um, any guesses if it's could. If, could I be wrong? Could this be Uranus? So it was it, just Neptune. after it, it's definitely Neptune. It's, it's smaller, right? So <laughs> it's got to be Neptune. And it turned out very well. Lovely colors. Yes, we were actually pleasantly surprised at how well the blue, blue green color came through. I mean, you know, obviously when you take a look at photos taken by the NASA spacecraft of these planets uh, or Hubble for that matter, or James Webb telescope these days, uh, you know, the, the color you see in the resolution is spectacular and amazing. And, you know, as someone using ground-based telescopes that are not quite at the billion dollar level, uh, you never know what you're going to see until you put it in the scope. And uh, we actually were very pleased with what it turned out. Amazing. So I'll just see if I can go forward uh, in time by about an hour. So I am fast forwarding. If anyone does want the full two and a half hours, um, they can find it on our playlist. This was just back for to a second. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, just before Jupiter. you go forward. So just so you also your uh, viewers can notice that there's two small dots on either side of Jupiter. Those are the moons Europa, I believe, on the left and Ganymede on the right. So uh, we can see uh, definitely the largest uh, Galilean moons, the largest uh, satellites of Jupiter in the image, you can see two of them. Yes, and that is one of the fun parts about watching Jupiter is that you do have those four large Galilean moons. Sometimes you'll even get a shadow from the moon on the planet. Um, they're very dynamic and fun to watch. Um, so to We even, uh, the first night, we even got one of Saturn's moons. I believe it was Titan, uh, visible within the frame. Um, it looked much like, uh, much like the moons that we were just looking at. It was like a little small dot. 
but it was incredible. I had, I had never had the opportunity to observe Titan before. And I took the opportunity to talk about um, the Cassini division, which is a resonance feature within the rings, which is caused by the gravitational influence of Titan. Um, you can kind of make it out in, uh, in this image, perhaps it's the, the, the largest gap in the ring structure. Uh, uh, it was, I, I, it was, it was a real treat. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it and uh, it was a nice pleasant surprise. Yeah, I don't think we saw we saw it on this particular night, but it is it is just possible to get the larger larger moon of uh, of Saturn. Um, now let me go back past Jupiter, and we'll go to our final planet. Now this was the planet Uranus, a little bit bigger than Neptune, and that was the last. I believe this was the end of the live stream that we were able to get from you. And but you did observe some other objects uh, after this. So on, on this night, I don't believe we did. The first night we observed, um, I believe we observed M11, M13. We observed Andromeda uh, and the Pleiades. Um, Mars was rising a little bit late uh, since because of the tree cover. It was, uh, it was unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to see it. Uh, but yeah, we, we observed a bunch, of, a bunch of objects on the first night. Amazing. And I do have it on good authority that um, we should also thank the friends of Killarney for putting out some refreshments because it went well past midnight, uh, which is definitely the time where everyone needs that extra cup of coffee. All right, so that's uh, the uh, I'll leave the uh, the playlist link in the comments if anybody wants it, just in case you didn't get enough live imaging. But we are not going to run it till midnight tonight, so good news. We are going to go ahead and go to the last day of Stars Over Killarney. Last but certainly not least, um, on Sunday we had the guided hike of uh, Granite Ridge, which um, you know sounds pretty interesting humans soils rocks and stars and that was your last uh, last wrap-up day um so uh quentin what were your last day sunday thoughts uh the the theme of this talk was the connection really about the connections uh between humanity and the soil beneath us the, the flora and fauna around us uh the the geology and the stars above us uh and it was just this lovely uh tour through um through, uh, through the Granite Ridge Trail, which begins in this uh, very thickly forested area and rises through the Granite Ridge all the way up to um, some of the highest points within that system. And you can see uh, off, in the, off on the horizon in this image, you can see, um, I believe it was the Laquash Mountain Range, which is uh, a much old, uh, which is a, a quartzite chain of mountains um, that, uh, is distinct and, and was created through separate geological features to the granite that we were standing on. Um, and, and you can really tell because the, the quartzite is this, is this lovely bright white color. If, if any of you ever go to Killarney Provincial Park, if you ever uh, hike a different trail called the Crack, that'll take you through a lot of quartzite. Uh, but the granite is this, is this deep kind of brownish pink and it's very distinct. It's, it's very clear that they were formed uh, through different processes. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed this tour. I, I really enjoyed all the tours, but I really, uh, I really enjoyed my time here. Well, if you are going to hike the crack, uh, just beware. It is, I believe, a slightly harder hike than uh, the, the three hour one we mentioned before. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So um, let's go ahead and just do final Sunday thoughts. Um, Bruce, uh, what's your wrap up for Stars Over Killarney thoughts here on the, the last, this is our, our last day slide here. It exceeded all my expectations. I think every single person really gave it their all. It shocks me continuously how we can get such incredible speakers and participants who are volunteers. I mean, almost everybody there in one way or another was volunteering their time way above and beyond what was expected of them. Uh, you know, our astronomer resident, Quentin, who did an incredible job, and Kathy and I are constantly commending him for his ability to communicate with the public and keep everyone engaged and enthralled. Uh, Oz was, was amazing. Uh, Sarah Mazrui, um, Bill Sherwood, the Sudbury North Bay Astronomy Clubs, the staff of Killarney, Kathleen, and everyone else who was there ensured that all the participants and the volunteers had an outstanding time 
Of course, having clear skies and a Milky Way and a dark sky preserve doesn't hurt too much. And the geology of Killarney speaks for itself. So uh, I was completely thrilled and uh, beyond myself. I was over the moon, pun intended, with how the program went. Excellent. Um, and so Kathleen, that leaves us uh, for you. Last thoughts on your um, on the Sunday of the um, uh, Stars Over Killarney event and um, any sort of wrap up thoughts you, you want to bring? Sure. Yeah, I think it's just to say that it was. It was an excellent event. Um, what a lovely way to showcase some of the different features that make Killarney Provincial Park so special and so significant and so worth protecting. Um, and it's a joy to be able to be part of a, a festival like this, a program like this, um, and be able to offer really meaningful and fun experiences for our visitors and for the volunteers who came out. So do we have a day yet for 2023? Uh, this is so exciting. So we do. Um, so we're delighted to announce that Stars Over Killarney 2023 will be happening on October 13th, 14th and 15th. Um, so that's something to mark your calendars with for sure. Um, with Ontario Parks, you're able to book your camping reservations up to five months in advance. So on your calendars, actually, you should be marking May 13th as the day that you want to go on to, <laughs> to book your campsite uh, so that you'll be able to join us for Stars Over Killarney 2023. Amazing. And we do have something coming up quite a bit uh, sooner, which I definitely want to give you a little time to talk about. Um, now this is happening, this uh, uh, Colors in the Cosmos is happening this year and next year, or is it only next year? Colors in the Cosmos is actually our, our our theme for next year. And so next year we're going to be focusing on the ways in which art and artistic endeavors overlap with astronomy um, in both looking at things like astrophotography, looking at the colors of the cosmos, um, and then also um, tying in another one of the in-residence programs that Clarney has, which is the artist in residence program, along with the astronomer in residence program. Amazing. And uh, is there any other details you want to share about that, or shall we let people find it on the website? Yeah, I, I think um, mostly we just want people to start getting excited about it. And the Ontario Parks blog is an excellent place to look for more details about, about this upcoming event. Amazing. So Ontario Parks blog, make sure to check it in addition to, of course, reading your astronomer in residence blogs. So as you may or may not know, all of our astronomer in residences, including Quentin Weyrich, who's here tonight, have made amazing blog posts all summer about their adventures. And um, the last blog post has gone out <laughs> because our astronomer in residence has finished for, for this year. But if you are applying for 2023, uh, keep in mind that October 13th through 15th might be a very desirable week to sign up uh, because Stars Over Killarney will be running in 2023 as well. So the Astronomer in Residence program has definitely ended with a huge success, I have to say. I'm absolutely delighted that it's gone so well and everyone has had such a wonderful time. Our 2023 applications will open in January. So if you are waiting uh, for applications, please wait until after the new year and then you can apply for the 2023, uh, 2023 program. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, lots of fun times and um, we will probably have to wrap up here because we are going a little bit longer than our usual Teletube episode length. Um, so Bruce, Kathleen, and Quentin, thank you very, very much for, for being here. Um, any last uh, comments or, or is everyone, everyone is just delighted to have, to have been at the SARS of, over Killarney. I just wanted to say, it's so great to be on one of these Teletubes again. I've missed you guys. Well, you can come back anytime. <laughs> um, great to have you here. And thank you, Bruce and Kathleen, for coming as well. So I am going to go ahead and pass for our final outro um, over to Zaina. So thank you, everybody, very, very much for coming along. Uh, we're going to turn off our videos now and head you off to the final outro for this episode. Thanks for joining and we hope that you all have wonderful clear skies. Take it away, Zaina. Thank you, Professor. 
Well, everyone, you have been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly tele broadcast, the Astronomy and Astrophysics program, written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Professor Hyde, Bruce Waters, Quentin Weirich, Kathleen Houlihan Shear, Dorsa, and myself, Zaina. Special thanks to our Astronomer in Residence program uh, partner, Killarney Provincial Park Observatory, and make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comments section of the video and talk to us in the chat right now. We will be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like to make a donation, see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca you can always connect with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Clear skies and have a good night.